Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, thank you, rejoinders. There's a little bit of a echo. I don't know whether or not that can be fixed or not, or maybe I'm just hearing it in my head. I'm Elizabeth Sackler, and I'm very happy to welcome you today to the Sackler Center and the Correctional Association of New York City are pleased to co-host, and we are co-hosting, this fall season's three-part series of States of Denial, the illegal incarceration of women, children, and people of color. Last spring, the Sackler Center began uh, States of Denial with three enlightening panels, uh, days uh, filled with information and organization it began, it was inaugurated by Sentenced to Change with Piper Kerman, and she moderated a panel with Stacy McGruder, Vivian Nixon, and Tina Reynolds. Uh, it was followed by the Correctional Association of New York's Executive Director, Sophia Elijah, who moderated Mass Incarceration's Impact on Latino Women and Children. It was with Herman Cervante, Gabriel Horozzo, Pritzko, Mercedes Smith, and Tamar Kraft Solar. We ended that season, um, that, that series, with Crime After Crime, which is the story of Deborah Prager in California who was incarcerated without parole. Um, and it was a fight. The, the, the film is a fight uh, about uh, uh, the, the legal battle for parole for her before her death and also against the justice system that is really stacked against battered women, as I think we all know. One of Deborah's attorneys, Joshua Safran, was here, and he joined me in conversation that afternoon. And many of those panelists are here today. So I'd like to thank you for your continued work. I'd like to thank you for joining us last year, and thank you for being here again uh, today. Uh, all three parts of that inaugural programming series uh, can be viewed on the Sackler Center website, which is at www.brooklynmuseum slash E-A-S-C-F-A slash videos. Uh, at the same time that we began uh, the series here in Brooklyn, I was leading an art workshop at Women's Maximum, Ma Maximum Security Prison in Niantic, Connecticut, York Penitentiary. And at the same time, over the years, the New Press had already published more than a dozen books, really at the rate of one per year, on the strategies, the impact, the profits, and the horrific human loss uh, and cost to our social and political system of mass incarceration and what it does to us here in the United States. Mass incarceration has, by design, destroyed entire populations and disenfranchised entire demographics of our country. Parallel, paralleling this um, is the privatization of prisons, which has become a highly profitable multi-billion dollar industry. And one example is the Corrections Corporation of America, known as most of you probably are aware as CCA, began in 1983 and first publicly traded on the NASDAQ in the mid-1980s. And since 1998, it has been traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and the, the stock uh, call letters, the trading symbol is CXW. And CXW closed yesterday at $35.05. Its div dividend yield is 5.82%. Uh, 5 and it has a market cap of $4.15 billion. It is listed as a socially responsible investment and was in 2013 approved by the IRS as a REIT, which many of you may or may not know, stands for Real Estate Investment Trust. It has several, and that has a lot of meanings, and we're not going to be able to go into it today, but I can assure you that we will have an opportunity at a future date to review all of this. They've had several stock splits, which of course means the stock has risen and done very well and split, 
it has risen and done very well and split. It's become kind of a darling of some of the hedge fund managers. And that is um, just the tip of that iceberg. Uh, there are links on my Twitter, uh, which is at Sackler Soapbox. Um, after my work with the women at York, I determined that the Sackler Center and the Brooklyn Museum would continue the series of states of denial, the illegal incarceration of women, children, and people of color until such time that women are protected from their abusers, not imprisoned for protecting themselves and their children, that we will continue until the United States has joined the 1959 Declaration of the Rights of Child, of the Child, ensuring children in our country protection under the law and from the law, and until such time as people of color in this country, whether Americans, immigrants, or visitors, are no longer considered guilty until proven innocent. May I have the first slide, please? In case you had any doubts, we are living in a mil militarized zone, coast to coast, and I provide the following. I don't know if the lights can be turned down a little bit uh, so that you can see the images. It's a little bit hard. This is from, this is enlarged from August 16th, uh, New York Times. And the caption reads, it's the spread of military surplus gear. And the caption reads, state and local police departments like the one in Ferguson, Missouri, obtain some of their military style, and I'm not, really sure what that means, um, equipment through a free defense department program created in the early 1990s. While the portion of their gear that comes from the program, this is still a quote, is relatively small, most of it is paid for by departments or through federal grants. Detailed data from the Pentagon illustrates how ubiquitous such equipment has become. The highlighted counties have received guns, this is still a quote, guns, grenades, launchers, vehicles, night vision, or body ar armor through that program since 2006. The upper left hand, um, uh, the upper left hand uh, map shows where aircraft, planes, and helicopters are distributed. The mid left is armored vehicles, including cars and trucks. The lower left is body armor, including vests and helmets. The upper right, <coughs> grenade launchers, usually used for smoke grenades and tear gas. The mid right is night vision, including sights, binoculars, and accessories. The lower right, assault rifles, 55.56 mil, I don't know about rifles, I guess, so they're not good. If all of these were stacked one on top of the other, there would be nothing but orange over the entire United States of America, which is an interesting color, I think, that the New York Times chose for this. Today, my hat goes off to the City Council of Davis, California, and their mayor, Dan Volk for refusing the latest donation of an armored car which was possibly just recycled from Afghanistan or Iraq. And if you go and see uh, today's paper or my tweet at Zackler Soapbox, um, you, you will um, get linked into this. Um, I love Twitters and I think we need to all start following Mayor Walk. He's at Dan Lower lower dash Volk, and it's W-O-L-K. Slide two, please, is a graphic. And it's a graphic, I think, that sort of says it all, and it's there for your viewing pleasure, as I have the pleasure of introducing today's panelists. Uh, those are some graphics of the materials, the items that are shipped around our country. The Correctional Association of New York was founded in 1844. 
is an independent nonprofit organization that advocates for a more humane and effective criminal justice system and a more just and equitable society. In 1846, the CA was granted authority by New York State Legislature to um, inspect prisons and to report its findings and recommendations to the public. This is pretty wonderful, and it's a good thing we have inherited this and it's been grandfathered in because it just occurs to me that I don't know if we would have that at this point in time. So we are very lucky. The CA has remained steadfast in its commitment to inform the public debate on criminal justice for nearly 170 years. The CA utilizes its unique legislative mandate to expose abusive practices, educate the public and policymakers about what goes on behind prison walls, and advocate for systemic, lasting, and progressive change. Working in collaboration with a broad base of stakeholders and advocates, the CA works to build the power of the communities most negatively affected by criminal justice policy and decrease the state's use and abuse of incarceration as a response to the socioeconomic problems facing our communities. The Correctional Association's efforts are driven by a deep faith, the inherent dignity of all human beings. They work to create a criminal justice system that treats people and their families with fairness, dignity, opportunity, and respect. Their job is no small one, and I applaud them and I thank them. After the Correctional Association's Executive Director, Sophia Elijah, her panel last spring, I had a meeting at the Association Uptown with Sophia and more than a dozen of her top staff from different departments and areas for which and for whom the CA advocates. At that meeting, I invited the Correctional Association to put together panel discussions for this opening salvo of states of denial. Today's panel is moderated by Sophia Elijah, our first panel, and our second by Bill Keller. And the panelists include Jack Beck, Brian Fisher, Professor Teresa Miller, Tyrell Muhammad, Daud Nasheed, Assemblymember Daniel Donnell, and Reverend Stephen Phelps. Uh, tomorrow's moderator, Tanisha Ingram, she'll introduce her panel, and Sophia is going to be your host for these three days of discussions. Uh, she and her staff have assembled them for us, and it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Sophia Elijah, and I'm very proud that the Brooklyn Museum and the Sackler Center for Feminist Art is providing this for you and this also will be viewed by video online, so if you have friends who you know would like to see what is coming up, or after you've seen it, who you know they have missed something, by all means, send them to our website. So I invite you to join me. Oh, I must read her bio for you, I'm sorry. Sophia Elijah is the direct, executive director of the Correctional Association. She is an accomplished advocate, attorney, scholar, and educator. Ms. Elijah is the first woman and the first person of color to lead the nearly 170-year-old organization in its mission to create a fairer, more effective, and humane criminal justice system. Prior to joining the staff at the CA in March of 2011, she served as deputy director and a clinical instructor at the Criminal Justice Institute at Harvard Law School. A native New Yorker, we both are, we are proud to say. She practiced criminal and family law in New York City for more than 20 years. Before moving to Harvard, she was a member of the faculty and director and supervising attorney of the Defender Clinic at the City University of New York. She's worked with the Legal Aid Society and been honored by the National Lawyers Guild in 2010 in Massachusetts. She has dedicated her life to human rights and social activism. She is recognized nationally, internationally, authority on human rights, and has authorized several, authored several articles and publications 
on US criminal and juvenile justice policy and prison conditions. So now, please join me in welcoming my sister, Sophia Elijah. You know, you just have to just love Elizabeth Sackler, not because she gives you a great bio, but because she has taken all of her access to power and to wealth and to influence and to focus it on what we feel is the number one civil rights issue facing the United States. She could do many other things, but she's doing that. And for that, we applaud her. I want to thank you for coming out. We're up against a few challenges. At the Correctional Association, we're always up against challenges. For the past two weeks, we've been up against no internet service. Um, but today, we're, we just got internet service back last night. That's probably why the MTA took us on today. And then we're challenged with the weather also. But you know, we overcome everything. So I'm going to just quickly tell you about the first three panelists that you're going to hear from. The first is Dawood Nash. Nasheed, who I met actually a few years ago, um, not in an auditorium like this, but in an auditorium that was run by the state. And it's wonderful to me. It's a true testament to him and to the work that we do that he's joining us today. Dawood has been a core leader of the Prison Visiting Project Advisory Council from the Correctional Association since its inception in 2000. 2013. He also works educating the public about health care choices and is a featured speaker at many conferences, helping educate and engage young people on criminal justice issues. Jack Beck is the director of the Prison Visiting Project at the Correctional um, Association, and he's been with us for 10 years. He is a tireless advocate. You ask anybody in docs, if you say Jack Beck, they're like, okay, okay, what do you want? What do you want? So um, Jack has a very long bio, but I'll just tell you briefly, before he joined the Correctional Association, he lit litigated against the uh, Department of Corrections for many years um, with, prisoners, with the Prisoners' Rights Project of the Legal Aid Society. And last but not least is Tyrone Muhammad, who's also a staff member at the Correctional Association. He's an advocate, youth mentor, workforce creator, and community leader. Mr. Muhammad has focused his energies on helping individuals in need, including formerly incarcerated persons and at-risk youth to lead better lives, build stronger communities, and obtain employment opportunities. I'm not going to say much more about them because once you hear from them, they, I'm sure, will tell you more about themselves and you will be as wowed as I am by them. So I'm going to, first we're going to see a little video clip, which Jack just told me, don't have us come up yet. So we'll do the video clip and then they'll join me on the stage for an engaging conversation. After we finish with them, we will have the second panel with Bill Keller, Assemblyman O'Donnell, Professor T Teresa Miller, and Reverend Stephen Phelps. Okay, I think it's on with the video. speak about revolution, they must speak about a change because we are human beings and we got to be treated like human beings. We are men. We are not beasts and we do not intend to be beaten or driven as such. We call upon all the conscientious citizens of America to assist us in putting an end to this situation that threatens the lives of not only us but of each and every one of you. We have set forth demands that will bring us closer to the reality of the demise of these prison institutions that serve no useful purpose to the people of America, but to those who would enslave and exploit the people of America. One of the large army helicopters has taken off. It is known that uh, the army helicopters are loaded with, uh, with what is called riot gas, though we're not quite sure what kind of gas it is. Anyway, here, uh, here come the helicopters, and they, uh, they are now heading for the prison. 
One of the large army helicopters now going overhead and over the wall into the prison. It was a slaughter line, man. It was, uh, people were, were defenseless. All right? they, they had sticks and uh, homemade weapons to defend themselves. But this doesn't compare, man, with, with magnums and carbines. beans. Well, this is ridiculous, you know? The next thing I know is this big helicopter flying over us and uh, tear gas is coming from everywhere. It's a whole lot of shooting going on. So naturally everyone is running for cover, you know. So I'm next to the wall and I know around me that everyone is hiding their face and dying and spitting in rags and putting it to their nose. But what I know was troopers start coming from everywhere. Then I start seeing people, different people fall, you know. They were, they were shot. Guys was losing their hand, shot in the head and the neck. The mass murder that took place, cold-blooded, premeditated murder. I am telling you what I seen with my own eyes. I speak of my dead brother, L.D. Barkley. I know for a fact that he was premeditatedly murdered. I know this. I was taken out of the yard and I was put on a table, nude. My body at present have cigar burns, cigarette burns all over it. My testicles at times bother me now from cigarette butts, sticks, rifles, laying on the table with my head looking up at the catwalk being spit on hot shells thrown on my body. I tried to cover up with my pillow. Can you imagine 250 pounds getting under a pillow? State troopers and police came by and said, nigga, get out from under that pillow. If we wanted you to have a cover, we would give you one. You are gonna die in the morning, nigga, so it don't make no difference. Nowhere, whether you freeze or we kill you. Nigga, black power, huh? Black power, huh? That's all was said to me while I was in that room trying to make me be the animal that he is to reverse the victim to the criminal, the criminal to the victim. As long as you take a man, a person, a woman, and treat him as a beast, you're gonna always have a problem in these concentration camps. Because what is happening in these institutions is the most cruel and unhuman punishment and treatment that any person can be exposed to. We are men. We are not beasts and we do not intend to be beaten or driven as such. People must know that we are dying. We are being murdered every day. That is what's happening in here, in all the Atticus over the world. What has happened here is but the sound of for the fury of those who are oppressed. What I see is this for the people in the street. I see, wake up. Stop hiding. Because the same thing is happening to me is happening to you. And deal. Petition. Rally it. Let the people know how you feel about your sons and your daughters that's incarcerated. Other than that, wake up because nothing comes to a sleeper but a dream. I'll ask our first panelists to come up and while they're doing so, I would like us all to reflect for a moment about what happened 43 years ago at Attica and the lives that were lost and the fact that New York State has yet to apologize to the families of the people who were killed by the troopers who were brought in, and they just murdered them. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Dawood Nasheed. I served 28 years in New York State Prison, um, and I'm here today to speak to you very briefly about um, my experience at Attica. Um, you know, for the first 20 years of my incarceration, I basically avoided the disciplinary um, facility uh, uh, which we call Attica um, because it's a disciplinary facility because this is where people 
who are ruled guilty of disciplinary infractions are sent after they serve their special term um, in the key block housing units. And so in 2005, um, I was ruled guilty of providing legal assistance to an individual. And as a result, I was given 90 days um, in a special housing unit. And upon being released from the special housing unit, um, I was placed on a bus and I was taken to Attica. Now, if you've been in New York State Department of Corrections for a minute or two, um, you've heard a lot about Attica. Attica is a place where no one in New York State prison wants to go um, because of the abuse that is historically engaged in, um, because of the abuse that occurs there today. Um, and so in 2005, I was taken to Attica, and immediately upon getting off the bus, um, we were told to line up, and one of the things that we were asked was to state was our DIN numbers. Um, and that immediately after that, we were asked to, to state why we landed in Attica. And I believe it was seven or eight of us. Um, many of us had infractions that were relatively minor. Um, again, I had an infraction that involved providing unauthorized use of assistance for legal um, matters. Some guys had te been tested positive for dirty urines. And so one by one, we state our uh, DIN numbers, we state uh, the cause while we're in Attica, and then they got to this one individual, and he chose not to state um, why he was there. He did state his DIN number. And after being repeatedly told to state why he was there, he just refused. And immediately, um, you know, many of the officers, um, the prison guards who are employed at Attica are very huge. Um, this guy, I believe he was six feet, six, five or six, seven. And he struck this man. And he struck this man with a blow that was so powerful that it knocked him down. Um, and then immediately after that, several of, of the other officers came and they began to beat him with batons. And all of this um, happened um, as a result of him choosing not to state why, choosing not to state why he was uh, in Attica. And so this is my first experience with Attica, this kind of abuse, um, this kind of intimidation um, is what happened. Um, and so, um, you know, there was nothing anyone can do for the individual. Um, they handcuffed him, they subdued him, and they took him off. But the message to us was a message of intimidation. The message to us was a message of fear. And that is what Attica is known for today. Um, as I told you, I, I, um, I winded up in Attica as a result of providing unauthorized legal assistance. Um, and so while I got to Attica, I used to go to the law library. Uh, I stayed in the law library. Um, and at times, I, was at, I would be asked to, to photocopy documents. And I guess the officers didn't like that. Um, and so one day upon returning from the law library, I, I, I returned to a cell that, you know, and I've had numerous cell searches, as you can imagine, over a 28-year period. But this particular cell search um, was, was, was the absolute worst. I mean, pursuant to the directives, they say when a cell is searched, um, the officer is, is responsible for putting items back where he found them. Um, but this particular cell search, um, um, I had everything that I had owned, everything that made life um, easier inside a prison, um, tossed on top of my bed um, from the Thai detergent um, to the liquid uh, dishwashing detergent, to open bags of rice, to mail that I had accumulated over the years, uh, an envelope over here, a letter over there. Um, and it was just the absolute worst. Um, it was no way possible. I didn't think it would be possible to put everything in one cell on top of a bed. But that is what happened. And as a result, um, I was given a a, a disciplinary infraction for having a social security card. Um, a social security card that happened to be my own. And so when I went to the disciplinary hearing, um, you know, it was clear that this was my social security card, a photocopy of my social security card. And I was still real guilty. I was still real guilty and told that um, in Attica, uh, we don't allow you to possess uh, your social security card. And so Attica- Your own identification. My own identification. Um, normally there's an identification card. Um, but I mean, the reality is that there are some directives in the state that 
permit you to have a social security card. But in Attica, um, it was in, the, in violation of their own laws. And so, um, you know, I attempted to reason with the hearing officer, um, and that was to no avail. Um, and so, one of the things that um, I need, you need to know about Attica is that Attica, though a part of the New York State Department of Corrections, it has its own sets of rules. It has its own guidelines. And then oftentimes those guidelines conflict with the rules that are established by the department. But there's no recourse. There's no accountability. It's just a culture of abuse. And that is still going on today. Um, I'm in touch with many of the friends I left behind in Attica. Um, and so this abuse continues. Um, and there's very little um, to being done about it. There's very little um, being spoken about. Because there's a, there's a culture of not only abuse, but of a culture of intimidation. And that is what you need to know about Attica. Thank you, Don. You're welcome. Thank you very much for sharing that. I'm going to turn to you, Jack. You have dedicated the last, gosh, all of your life to taking on the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, as it's known now, DOCS. And I'm going to ask you if you would briefly share with the audience some of your insights from where you sit at the Correctional Association. Uh, thank you, Sophia. Um, I've been going upstate to New York State prisons for 33 years. Uh, and Attica, unfortunately, has been a frequent place that I go to. I did it as a lawyer on behalf of litigation and now for the last 10 years for the Correctional Association. When the Correctional Association goes into a prison, uh, we spend generally two days in that facility and we go everywhere we can in the facility. We literally go to every housing area, every program area, staff is with us, but our whole notion is, and actually today is largely about, trying to bring the voice of the people inside out of those walls to the public. Um, when we do that, we are one of the things we're doing is actually asking every person that we meet whether they would like to get a survey from us about conditions inside. And at Attica, like at other places we've been at, we received several hundred surveys, more than 300 surveys of people inside. We did that in 2011, wrote a very large report that details all the problems, uh, the many problems. But Attica has not changed. Attica has not changed, unfortunately, since 1971 when there was a riot till the present. The same attitude and um, conditions kind of exist of oppression, violence, and force. And so this year, again, looking at getting ready for the anniversary, we said we had to do something more. We've reported the big numbers, we've looked at the data, but we really wanted to get the voices from inside heard. And so we corresponded with 100 different individuals that we had known at Attica. We went up and went through 40 long, detailed interviews. Out in the back, if you came in, we, get, we have put together the stories of 12 very brave men who have decided to come forward and actually let us tell a brief part of their story anonymously. And today, what we're trying to do is our whole function for this visit uh, and the several visits in 2014 is to ask this question, why is Attica so bad? What does that abuse mean? How is it being done? And what, if anything, can be done about it? I don't want to leave any surprise. We think that the only way to really correct Attica is to close it. And we'll go into more detail. <laughs> but I want to leave out what is the problem? What is the problem with Attica? And we're about to issue a report probably in the next two or three weeks. You'll look out on our website and it'll be another large report that's collected a lot of data because we recently got a FOIL request um, from the state about every disciplinary report from 2010 until 2013. It represented 270,000 disciplinary hearings. But more than that, those are multiple actually violations in each one because they issue about 135,000 to 150,000 separate violations every year in the prisons. We have basically a prison system that tries to control people by discipline, whether it makes sense or not. And their discipline is translated into isolating them in solitary confinement. But that's getting a little ahead of the story. What we tried to do is we went in there and we tried to talk to people and said, what is the nature of the problem? And there are several. 
First of all, it starts with just physical force. They beat people up. Daoud's story, we have heard and documented, has happened in every decade of every individual I've ever talked to. When you enter Attica, there is an opening introduction. And they pick somebody out in the group that is there, and they will intimidate them, insult them, and possibly abuse them, because they're making a statement. And we had this story repeated by everyone we interviewed. There's a statement there that says, you are now at Attica, and Attica we control, and we're gonna show you how we control it. That force happens everywhere, but it's particularly focused from what we got in two blocks, A block and C block. And by the way, we've looked at data, and our, the anecdotal stories are confirmed by the other information that we got. So when we looked at unusual incident reports about assaults on staff, and by the way, that means if there's ever a confrontation with an incarcerated person, it turns into assault on staff, even if the only injuries are to the fist of the officer and the face of the uh, incarcerated person. And what we found is that there are massive numbers of assaults on staff, by the way, in A and C block, and another area, in the corridor. We have to talk about the corridor of Attica. The corridor of Attica, when you walk in Attica, you have to walk around silently with your head down, and the staff escorts everyone with their baton out in their hand, tapping it on it. I've been there, I've observed it. This doesn't happen at any other prison. This is oppression and force. But if you have a number of incidents in the corridor, which we documented in this data, that happens because they do another thing. When they want to assault an individual, what they often do, and if we have formerly incarcerated people here, although relate to it, is put you on the wall. Mm. You're gonna now be searched. And they spread you out, you have your hands on both sides and your feet spread out. And if you lift a hand or get off the wall, they can now say that you're resisting them and they can assault you. And we had countless numbers of stories of having this happen. If they want to get to someone, they put them on the wall, they kick their feet, they try to insult them, they grab them, unfortunately, trying to search them, which means running their hand up their buttocks or grabbing their testicles. Sorry to be graphic, but this is what happens. And if they do anything, they will then be assaulted. Well, Attica has one of the few places where they have all these unusual incidents occurring in the corridor when people are under tremendous control. These are examples of that. We also have abusive pat frisks and even sexual violence. And so we see that. And we see repeatedly, and in the documentation we see on discipline, on unusual incidents, it is confirmed. There's another type of violence that goes on. It's abuse of authority. If they don't beat you at Attica, then they get other ways of intimidating you and abusing you by harassment, by um, racial epithets, I'm sorry the word nigger is used all the time at Attica. You can't talk to anyone who says that that's not how they talk to people. It's a term that is addressed to people all the time. And when you have 80% of the population that are people of color and almost no people of color on the staff, you can see where that's a problem. I'll get to racism more in a moment. But this abuse of authority also goes in other ways because Attica does their own informal punishment besides discipline. Mm. What they'll say is, you're going to your cell, you're not coming out for a week. That's not any order. That is something that they say, but if you come out, you will get a ticket and you will get assaulted. And so people are afraid and they just stay inside. I interviewed a man in his 60s who said, I can't take it anymore, so I just never leave my cell. I can't have a job or anything, I'm just gonna stay inside because I'm too afraid to come out. Self-imposed isolation. And finally, what they do is they write up false tickets. And false tickets is a, a great reality there. Because remember, as Dawood described, you know, your cell, they can come in and search at any time, and it is so easy to put in a, a weapon or contraband or anything like that and get a ticket. Finally, there is this notion, if you complain, we will retaliate. And that retaliation takes the form of um, false tickets, but it also is having I am staff member A, you insulted me, but I'll have my buddy who works on the same shift come in and find something to get back at you. So we see abuse of authority. Finally, we see massive discipline, this thing that I talked about. It's hard to kind of describe, but there were 6,600 tickets that they wrote just at Attica over a four-year period of this data that we looked at. 
This represents almost half of the population at Attica got a ticket at Attica. 2,766 people were sent to the SHU during that time period just from that one prison. 450 people had accumulated SHU time that's more than a year. If you've ever been homesick for three or four days in your bedroom and you kind of get antsy, imagine being locked in your bathroom nearly 23 to 24 hours a day for a year. This is what they're doing to the people there. And there is massive amount of that. We looked at all the disciplines for assault on staff. There were 238 different hearings where there were assault on staff. 237 people were found guilty. There was one amazing person, for some reason that wasn't, and I can't understand why. Even if they find them not guilty of the assault on staff, though, they charge them with other things, and so everybody went essentially to the box. Racism. Racism, you cannot look at Attica and not think about racism. Racism is overt. There are people with tattoos um, that, that are racist in conduct. There's a story we hold and repeated by others on a Christmas tree. They had a little black baby with a noose around put on the Christmas tree. KKK tattoos. This is not subtle. This is overt. And finally, there is this sense of a culture of violence. What we often say is, it's not some prisons, there are a few bad apples of staff that are, are violent, that are difficult. But this is a culture that actually takes people who have actually worked at other facilities and people say they were not so bad. They get to Attica, they're overcome by that violence. And this is the point why we started with that film. We're not trying to repeat the film, but it seems today, 43 years later, the staff at Attica think that a riot is about to occur tomorrow and they approach the population that way with such intimidation and force so that everyone gets corrupted by it. Everyone, it's an us versus them. You have to choose sides. If you treat an incarcerated person as a human being, you're taking their side. And that intimidation and force corrupts everyone who is there, population as well as staff. They change where violence is the, and force, is the mechanism for how one communicates. So we see violence among the population. And people feel so disempowered that force is the only way to, to assert that. And then finally, we Jack, have to say this. I'm, I, I'm I've learned ahead. something that you've said finally four times. Okay. So I'm gonna ask you if you could give us your real final so we can get to Muhammad yes, and then I'm gonna circle back. So lastly, I just wanted to say that the result is self-harm of people inside. Um, and, and unfortunately at Attica, has one of the highest suicide rates in the state. And in literally at four prisons, um, there are 44% of the suicides happen in just four prisons, and Attica is one of them. So these walls have too much violence in them, behind them, too much history of abuse, there's too much intimidation, too much fear, and finally, there's too much hatred for it to be forgotten or forgiven or practically to change. And that's why we must close those doors. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Terrell Muhammad. I spent 26 years and 11 months in New York State Prison from the age of 19 to the age of 45. From 1982 to 1984, I was in Attica. I knew um, Big Black, he was one of my mentors. Matter of fact, we have one of the lead attorneys here today, mm. Elizabeth Fink. Let's give a round of applause. Looking at the film and remembering when I was there, as you've seen, it was black men, Latino men, poor white men. The demographics haven't changed. And what's sad is that the culture that Dahu talked about is allowed to exist because prisons are built and located in upstate rural areas throughout America. And unfortunately, throughout America, we still have a racial divide. Jack Beck talked about the racism at Attica, but not just at the facility, outside the town of Attica. The town of Attica has a culture of racism. 
So that's why Attica is allowed to exist. A Ferguson, Missouri is allowed to exist. The culture that killed Eric Gardner is allowed to exist because this is a culture of overt racism that we tend to turn a blind eye to. And we never had that discussion. So when we ask the question why, the question should be asked. Why we didn't have that discussion in Congress concerning slavery and racism? See, we refuse to have that discussion so Attica exists. And because Attica exists, people were being dehumanized. The only reason why it can exist is because those who work there have to see me and others like me as something less than. You couldn't do that job to see me as an equal or as a human being. You couldn't see me as a human being beating me down day after day. Not just physically, but mentally and psychologically. Every day. If I have to see an officer come in with a tattoo with a baby noose on his arm, his sleeve rolled up, looking like the Marlboro Man, and he calling me a nigga, nigga, it's time for child. Nigga, it's time for the count. This is the language that's used every day. At one time, you couldn't even speak to an officer. The officer wouldn't even speak to you. He used his baton. If he hit the cell gate one time, that means to step out. If you hit it twice, that means to walk. And when I was there, we refused to obey by that rule. We refused to adhere by that rule. Because we said, we're human beings. You can talk to us. And if you can't talk to us, then don't deal with us. Get another job. I was in Attica when affirmative action came in, from 82 to 83. They bring blacks and Latinos from Rochester and Buffalo to work there. They didn't last a year. This was staff. They got beaten up. They got raped. They got chased out of there. They, they went to a facility that had to open up in Rochester or Buffalo called Windy Correctional Facility. It was like an exodus when they opened that facility. Every black staff, every Latino staff left out of there. See, this is allowed to happen. No one questioned why the staff wanted to leave. We want to integrate the population of the correctional staff, but it didn't work. This is how powerful the overt racism is. Albany, those that's in power, the politicians, we turn a blind eye to this. Because it's a, it's a, it's a messy, it's too messy for us. But it's getting more messy. Another article is just on, on the verge of happening. You only can dehumanize someone but for so long. Believe me, a coward will fight back. And if you continue to allow this to happen, see, we, we, we set up campaigns. We protest. We march. We want our voices to be heard. But when you come here to a forum like this, you're supposed to be motivated to get involved to end this type of treatment. Because this is not just a feel-good speech or informal commercial. What we're speaking about is to empower you and to inspire you to get involved. We talk about shutting down Attica. Well, that's a long battle, 43 years. We talk about a paradigm that was based upon punishment. America has used the prison punishment paradigm and its policy of corrections, and it doesn't work. In the real world, if you have a policy like that and you don't get no results, you get fired. Some of them people need to be fired. But we turn a blind eye to that. We ask about more solutions that can be transparent to make things more aware to the public, like to have more cameras. Well, they got cameras there, but not enough. But understand something. A human being controls those cameras. We ask to have Public reports done at least four times a year. That can occur. But who really read those reports? Do you? No, because you don't go to our website. <laughs> I'm just talking the truth here. Because if we do not open our eyes and wake up, as Black said, Attica will be happening all over again and then we'd be back to square one, why? 
And we don't have to wonder why, because it happened already. The answer is, we were silent. When we look at this world, remember, in Nazi Germany, good folks was quiet while wicked things were going on. And because they were quiet, when it got to their door, they wanted the world to see. They wanted someone to come to their aid, but there was no one there to do so. Family, don't wait. We have, in the back, we have sign-up seats. Get involved. We have a website. Go to our website. Don't come here for today, then go back and have a discussion as if it was a topic of some informal information. Leave here today and get yourself involved and others involved. Because we have to shut down Attica. There's no question about it. We can't allow people to continue to be degraded. We can't allow our loved ones to come home with that psychological scar. And we're wondering why they're always returning back to prison. Or we're wondering why they can't sleep at night. Or we're wondering why they're introverts. Some serious things occur to them. And it shouldn't happen. Many of our legislators, they know about Attica, but it's not politically good to take on a cause like that. But guess what? If you're a human being and you stand for what's right, then you stand to do what's right. Of course, many of the men went there before problematic behavior or criminal behavior, but don't you supposed to be rehabilitated there? Isn't it supposed to be an institution where you get your life together so you can come home to be a productive citizen? Or is it a place where you're going to be dehumanized and then come back to the world thinking that the world owes you something and you become worse off than when you went in? Get involved, family, because Attica is all of us. Thank you. Thank you. two quick comments from the audience and then we're going to change panels. We're going to do the Q&A at the very end. I'm reading, so my name is Raina Lennon. I am married to someone at Attica and I am going to read something that he wrote and that was kind of co-written by someone at CA. It's called Coping in Attica State Prison. While on a visit recently, I said some mean things to my wife, Raina, the most compassionate woman I've ever known. Days later, she wrote me in a letter that sometimes I don't know how much of your meanness is from the awfulness of Attica or if it's your personality. That stung. But it's the former, I think, that often shapes the latter. I've served 13 years of a 28 years to life sentence for shooting a man to death on a Brooklyn street. It was a terrible crime for which I am incredibly sorry. I've done most of my time in Attica, a place where 43 people were killed 43 years ago. Today, Attica remains a toxic environment. Fear and anger permeate perpetually. That is why the culture of Attica only promotes retribution and incapacitation. As for rehabilitation, it almost only exists in the form of volunteer programs. Unfortunately, volunteers only have the wherewithal to help but a few. Thousands languish on waiting lists. I'd love for administrators to use me to help my peers. However, today I swing a mop as a porter and spend most of my time in my cell reading and writing. Administrators in Attica, indeed, squander their incarcerated person resources. Security, security, security. It is the eerie mantra that will always be at the forefront at Attica. The lack of opportunities increases contentious relationships and violence at Attica. Added to that, security overshadows every other concern. The result is a palpable tension that lies under the surface. There is always intimidation and incidents of abuse particularly in A block and C block. Abuse is continuous because it is part of Attica's history and the ongoing culture that arises from that history. I was at Attica in 2007 and returned again in 2009. From 2007 until today, Attica has remained a mean, bleak environment. Whatever is done will ultimately not be enough to change the decades-long prevailing culture at Attica. In the end, the prison should be closed. There's a meanness that operates in Attica. The coldness of the place affects you. At times, thoughts arise, and I have an internal wrestling match, which I grapple with both my resentments at the stupidity and destructive inefficiency of Attica, as well as the stupidity and arrogance of my crimes. 
These self-loathing bouts pummel me emotionally and perhaps pummel my peers too. Sometimes we become angry and mean. It is sad though because we wind up being mean to the ones who love us most. Thank you. This letter is from my son. And it says, torture in Attica's box. The shunt is intended to mentally torture. It is designed to break you. There is constant noise, arguing, and yelling. There are no rehabilitation processes at all. What is the sense of being here? There is no purpose other than painful idleness and mental aggust. Where is the rehabilitation? I have been in solitary confinement nearly 11 years. The box is starting to get to me. I suffer anxiety very often. I will all of a sudden start hearing fast-paced breathing, and I cannot stop it. I have begun to suffer high blood pressure after being in the box. I also suffer from hallucination. Sometimes I think people are calling my name, or I think I see people walking by, but there is no one there. Last week I heard a train going by, and no one else heard it. It makes you so crazy. This box has a major impact on my family too. I haven't been able to hug my mom in 10 years. My biggest fear is that I will get a letter saying that my mom has passed away. I have to see my, I have to see my finding, my find, <laughs> excuse me. I have to see my finance, my financy, <laughs> financy, excuse me. And my financy daughters through a gate. That is the only way that little girl knows me. Yesterday was my birthday. It was really hard to spend my birthday in this box alone without any of my family members or any other human being to do nothing on my birthday but sit in my cell and think about the fact that I have lost 10 years of my life in this box. It is so hard to bear. And as if the insulation of the box itself wasn't enough, the relationship with the correctional officers at Attica are terrible. There is constant mental torture at Attica. Correction officers know how to play mental torture, harassment, abuse, and threats. For example, it is a real problem that it is the COs handling your food. There is always a constant fear that any day the correction officer will slip something into your food and they will do stupid stuff to play on that fear. They will say things like, enjoy your food, in a way that makes you think that they did something to it. And even if they didn't actually do anything, it messes with you, or a CO will put coloring in your water to make it look like urine, and then they make comments like, sorry, couldn't hold it. Unfortunately, it's not just me who suffers abuse, and it is not just in the box. There are always guys coming into the box at Attica after they was assaulted by the staff. Some, something has to be changed. These guys took 10 years of my life. No one else should have to endure this torture in the box at Attica or anywhere. I want to thank this panel, and we'll pull up our next panel that will be headed by Bill Keller. And while they're coming up, I'm going to read Bill's file. Come on up. So Bill is the first editor-in-chief for the Marshall Project. Prior to joining the Marshall Project, which just started, um, he worked at the New York Times from 1984 to 2014 as a correspondent editor, and most recently, as op-ed columnist. From July 2003 to September 2011, he was the executive director of the Times. I won't say any more. His bio is quite impressive. You will hear from him and the rest of our panelists. We'll have Reverend Phelps, Assemblyman O'Donnell, and Professor Teresa Miller. Thank 
you, Sophia. Um, our new project, the Marshall Project, uh, is not an advocacy group. We're a journalistic group, uh, but um, uh, I do have a weakness for Sophia Elijah, and uh, I basically salute when she asks me to do something, so that's why I'm here today. Uh, let me introduce the rest of the panelists, and then put a couple questions to the, to the group. Uh, Daniel O'Donnell, uh, who is an assemblyman for the Upper West Side and Morningside Heights, uh, is also, for the last, what, 18 months or so, yes. uh, the chairman of the Corrections uh, Committee in the Assembly. Uh, he just paid his first visit to Attica. Uh, Reverend Stephen Phelps is a former interim senior minister at the Riverside Church. Uh, he has uh, uh, also been a professor in the master's program at Sing Sing. Uh, and has racked up something like 200 visits to Attica over the years. Uh, and uh, Terry Miller is Vice Provost and Professor of Law at SUNY Buffalo, and for the past five years or so, advisor to the Lifers Group at Attica. She also made uh, two documentary short films on uh, Attica. So we have um, people who know the place about as well as you can know it without having been an inmate there, I think. Uh, and I'm going to start with Assemblyman O'Donnell. Um, uh, I know you're relatively new to the job of corrections chair, but in the last uh, 18 months or so, I think you told me you'd been to 20 prisons. That's uh, correct. Uh, and your first visit to Attica was just within the past week. On 9-11. On 9-11. So how does it compare? Um, much to my shock, it was not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Uh, and it was not the worst I had been to. Um, I believe that that change is partially the result of the Correctional Association because I read their report in my hotel room the night before. Um, I had been to Albion the day before, which is a woman's prison, and um, uh, much of what they wrote in the report uh, was still going on, but the some of the staff who was with me who were there three years ago said that when they walked down the hallways, none of the inmates would talk to them, they wouldn't make eye contact, they wouldn't. Um, that was not what happened with me. I talked freely with inmates throughout. I was there for three and a half hours. I talked to 30 or 40 of them. Um, walking down the halls, in the classrooms, uh, in the solitary units, I, I, so it wasn't, what I had feared it would be. Um, about two or three weeks ago, I was at Clinton, um, which, which was really, really bad. Mm -hmm. And the explicit detail about how the inmates were beaten by staff and where they were beaten by staff was um, really horrific. Um, that is not what the, I meet with what's called the inmate leadership teams alone in these prisons. And so, um, to the extent that they can talk freely, this is as free as they can be because there are no corrections staff in the room when I'm having these conversations. Um, and there are continually problems with C block, um, which I read about in the report. Um, they have a relatively new superintendent and I think he has made a change and a difference. Um, I went into the visiting room and talked to inmates during their visits. Um, at some of the prisons I've been to, there is only, uh, there's a plexiglass partition between family members. That was not the case at Attica. It was like a cafeteria room where people sat next to one another freely, could hold hands, could talk. Um, that was more freedom than I had experienced in other places. And so, uh, is it a bad place? Yes. Was it the worst that I've seen? No. Let me put you on the spot and ask, you know, the Correctional Association uh, strongly advocates closing Attica. Um, do you support that uh, demand? Do you think it can be fixed rather than shut down? Uh, when I got this job the first week, I asked then Commissioner Fisher when he was closing Attica. So whether or not I agree with that is a pretty much a given. The answer is yes. However, 
the problem that was described about who works there and uh, what the nature and culture around prisons, you know, what good does it do us to close Attica if the very culture and attitude is going to exist, exist in Great Meadow and Clinton and Green? Uh, when I was meeting with the inmate team in Green, they said to me that they have never, these are people who came from Attica. These are inmates who were in Attica, who are now in Green, and said to me, I have never met a group of people who enjoy putting their hands and feet on you like the people here at Green. So shutting Attica would be a good idea, but I'm not so sure that's gonna solve the problem because the problem's not much better at Green, and I think the problem is worse at Clinton. So Professor Miller, um, I guess the first question is, you spent some time in Attica. Do you agree that it is improving? And then the, the larger question, of course, is uh, uh, can it be fixed or should it be closed? So I've spent some time um, in the last uh, 15 years with students in, inside and outside Attica, also as the uh, Lifers Group advisor. Um, you know, part of the problem is that the way in which Attica is run as a prison, as some people commented before, it's, it's security first, it's hands-on first. And I have, I'm very fortunate to work with a marvelous group of, of men at Attica who are serving life and who have spent dedicated hours and hours and hours of their time to making the place better, right? So I think um, I, I too am impressed by the new superintendent. Um, uh, I, I, I think that um, Attica needs to, well, all prisons need to adopt a different model um, and one that, that doesn't have that hands-on first and then, and, and then we'll talk, right? But first, really, I, mean, I think what's striking about Attica is you, you, you see people with incredible human potential and it's wasted. Um, you see people who are not the same people they were 20 years ago when they did horrible things, um, but they're still treated as if they're the same person. You see officers who treat, uh, officers who are proxies for victims, right, whose job it is to make sure you know how much the world hates you, as opposed to helping you to uh, grow, develop, and get on with your life and, and become a better person. Um, I, as, an, as a person who uh, lives and works in Western New York, um, it is not a very popular thing uh, to advocate for the closing of Attica, right? A lot, it, it ensures a lot of people's jobs, but corrections is not a jobs growing industry, right? It's an industry in which we're supposed to positively affect society by, um, by uh, decreasing the risk of crime. So yes, should Attica be closed? Sure, it absolutely should but we also need to pay attention to what's gonna to happen to all the other prisons um, and to make an you know, effect a real culture change there, a, a change of model. Reverend Phelps, what are your thoughts? Have you been, you, you've probably got the longest uh, track record of, of any outsider. Well, <laughs> oh, I don't know that it's longer than, than uh, Professor Miller's. Brief history, I moved to Buffalo to serve a church in 1999, around this time of year. And before the year was out, I had begun volunteering with an organization in Western New York called, well, today it's called uh, Peace Prince Ministries, but it was called Cephas. And some of you in the room undoubtedly recognize the name. Cephas was started by a charismatic man in 1972. It was part of the successful, there were few successful responses to the rebellion, but that was one, where volunteers, civilians, as we're called, would go in to have conversation open-ended in purpose, not to try to be experts to train anybody to do anything, but to have an open-ended conversation about what matters. And sometimes a volunteer would be on the hot seat as much as anybody else. It might have been formed a little bit on the pattern of a tea group or the encounter group that was well known in the 60s and 70s. I had 10 years uh, in Buffalo uh, before I moved here to New York and in that time was in that conversation essentially twice a month, sometimes three times a month. So I've had lots of experience. And I want to hold up one thing that is fitted to my life work, which is 
I'm interested in the process of an individual's coming to awareness of her freedom. That is to say that rather than being reactive and being stuck in whatever it is I got to do, that I realize I have some openness and some freedom. The intelligence that the men in Attica brought to that kind of a question was extraordinary and so exciting to be part of that I, as a pastor on the outside, had to admit there are no conversations going on in any church that I know of that have this degree of seriousness about the possibility of interchange. Now, I hold that up not to praise the prison system, God knows, but rather just to, to say, to reaffirm something that was said earlier, the men, some of them, I wouldn't begin to know what fraction of all, have changed. And so all of this energy of racism that America applies to its men and women in prison is applied out of a fierce uh, ignorance on the part of white America, which is focused on some animal I'm going to use that ugly word that it has created in its own mind, it here being white power structures in America. And that crushing attitude, we will hurt this dangerous creature, is actually part of this awful process we're in in America. I want to hold, pull back uh, to a New York Times pair of articles many of you have read, no doubt, in the last couple of weeks. Nicholas Kristof writes, what white people don't get, or maybe the title was slightly different. You read that? And then, deeply unhappily, part two the next week. What was so unhappy about it? He reports in his second op-ed that the conversation, that the correspondence that he got from his first accounting of what white people don't get was a tidal wave of resistance. No, we are not racist, we're nice white people. And, and they have the problems they are doing. If only they would stop. This is the issue that, that on the one hand, men inside are finding ways to deal seriously with their processes. America on the outside is finding very few ways to become conscious of its racism. And so I have uh, one of my callings in this life as a white man, and sometimes a person who is in a very traditional place of authority, is to bring home to listeners who might be in the movable middle the possibility that they look, that we look, that I look at my own privilege and racism and open up a space of freedom so that I can shift and you can shift. Because frankly, the, 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 the seriousness of the problem we're facing in America with the mass incarceration as, it, as the new Jim Crow in Michelle Alexander's phrase, the seriousness of that problem goes all the way down through over 400 years of behavior and it will not change swiftly. I'll just conclude this remark by pointing out the sober attitude that anybody trained in systems theory would understand, family systems or other systems. Systems are structured with all kinds of emotional needs and patterns, and they don't just change when a law gets changed, but consciousness Consciousness is always the key. And so finding means by which those on the outside have a more profound conversation about racism and about poverty and frankly about militarism, the, the giant triplets of Martin Luther King's phrase. Uh, this, is, this is part of what I'm committed to be involved in. Well, let me pick up on that. Um, Professor Miller, referred earlier to the fact that, uh, among other things, places like Attica are sort of pork barrel projects. They have mm. local economic interests at stake, and so they, um, uh, you know, one of the big obstacles in reforming prisons, or certainly in closing prisons, is that you have vested interests. But I think there's a larger uh, obstacle to reforming prisons, uh, which we saw in New York earlier, a small example of earlier this year, when 
Governor Cuomo proposed to, to budget $1 million, uh, a tiny drop mm -hmm. in the corrections budget of the state of New York, uh, for college programs behind the walls. Uh, and he was immediately hammered, not just by, Repub mostly by Republicans, but not just by Republicans, I mean Democratic lawmakers as well, jumped all over him at the idea that we would you know, when their kids can't afford college, we would even think of paying for college uh, for, uh, you know, people who've been convicted of serious crimes. Uh, and the governor backed down, or he backed most of the way down and said that he would try to finance the program with, with philanthropic donations. That reaction in uh, uh, a, a relatively liberal state by a relatively liberal governor does not exactly pr provide an encouraging message for those who would like to fix the prison system. How do you deal with that? Uh, anyone? Welcome to my world, yeah. okay? Hmm. Um, hate to say this on the videotape, but here you go. Um, I have been trying through back channels for over six months to get the governor and the put in the budget uh, the very thing that he proposed. Unfortunately, he didn't... <laughs> there was a very easy way to do that, which was go back to the days when TAP, Tuition Assistance Program, was available. And you could do that and put that into a change in the education budget and not cause the uproar that you're going to do by announcing it. I was called on a Saturday night at 7.30 p.m., and told he was announcing it at 9.30 the next morning at a church in Albany. And I know he's running for re-election, but there are people who agree with him. If you maybe reached out to them and had a conversation with mm -hmm. them about the strategy for how to accomplish it, maybe there would be a different way to do that. So in the end, I think that the, what happened was more of a political reaction to the strategic decision making about how to roll it out rather than the underlying substance. However, I can assure you that it, at the prisons that I've been to that have an education program and every superintendent who I ask, would you want more of them or would you like one if you don't have one, they all say absolutely yes. Um, the inmates have told me that they get that very reaction from the guards. They get taunted by the guards for attending college programs, and it's the same thing. I have to pay to send my kid to, to, CUNY, to SUNY. Why do you get to get one for free? And so uh, in, you know, medium security prisons without, you know, the, the culture of Attica, that pushback still exists. I remain hopeful that we will be able to address this problem because it's clear that education programs are A, good for the prisoners, B, they make the prison safer, and as I pointed out to my Republican colleagues who represent where the prisons are, do you think they're hiring someone from the Upper West Side to teach at Attica? No, they are not. They're hiring local people. So if you have a local college that has to hire two or three more people to be able to facilitate this program, that's job growth where you live, not where I live. Um, but it's a fight I will continue to make as long as I'm chair of the committee. Mm. So 2% um, recidivism rate for college educated right. prisoners, what does that tell you, right. right? I mean, clearly it's, you know, the Lifers Group at Attica just did a forum called Education the Anti-Crime. They get it, they get it. Um, but I think this, and, and actually I did some talks on exactly that, that, this issue in Buffalo and got just this blowback reaction uh, from people who began again looking at, well, what about my kid and what about, and, and then he's going to have to compete with a job and what he didn't commit a crime. And what I think we lose track of is we, we have a generation of, of, of kids now and, and, you know, 30 years of mass incarceration. We used to think differently about what it was prisons did, right? Mm -hmm. So you pay your debt to society. You've done something wrong. You've done something that hurt society, was harmful. You get a timeout, right? And then when you come out, you are 
back in that society being a contributor, making a contribution. Now, mass incarceration has you know, inculcated this you know, uh, lock the door and throw away the key mentality. And I think the, the, the problem is that we think of it as a zero sum game, right? We, m m your gain is my loss. Um, we, we, and, and, and in fact, you know, one, one of the things I've learned uh, be spending so, many, so much time in Attica is that you know, maximum security incarceration like the type that is at Attica, it damages everyone, right? Uh, people on both sides of those bars, right? So correctional officers are kind of like coal miners, right? They do the work because it's there, but it harms them. Right? They have an average ex life expectancy of 59 years. Hmm. They have high rates of alcoholism, domestic violence, drug abuse, depression, suicide. Um, PTSD is not uncommon. Right? These, this, is not a, you know, this is not something that makes, you know, it's, it's not a career that is you know, kind of healthy. Right? People do it because it's work. People who are incarcerated also are damaged in, in ways that have been detailed earlier. I won't re repeat them, but you know, certainly by high rates of violence and, and other things that, that make them unhealthier and at risk. So it's not a good thing for anyone to grow a big prison system. We need to be dealing with things a different way. And I think the thing that's most poignant um, that may help you to kind of, will help to encapsulate this, this idea of a zero sum game is I happened to be at the front desk, the front gate at, At at Attica while a gentleman was walking out in street clothes. He was a prisoner who was being released. He was kind of looking around, looking for the folks who were gonna pick him up, drive by and pick him up from the prison. And as he walked past that final barrier, right, walked out into the sunlight, the guard at the door said, I'll keep your cell warm, you'll be back, right? which is, uh, you know, that's a sort of very cynical attitude about what the prison system does, um, you know. Right, reflected in the statistic, recidivism statistics, that it's actually probably true. Right, well, and, and certainly without the influence, without the ability to become educated, to get skills, usable skills, because what, what, what passes for skills programs is woefully inadequate to reintegrate into society, as one of my lifers who just got released last week has been telling me. I want to drag this back down to the level of politics for a second. I mean, you know, it's, I, I think it's true what Reverend Phelps said, that this is deeply rooted in the culture and the psychology of a, a, a country and goes back to, you know, as Michelle Alexander and Brian Stevenson so well articulated. This, you know, mm -hmm. Brian Stevenson describes what we're in as the fourth, uh, mass incarceration as the fourth phase of slavery. Yeah. Uh, and there's a strong case for that. But to be realistic, we're probably not going to make that psychology and culture go away overnight. Right. Uh, that's the long arc. What can we do in the short run? What, what would be some examples of doable things that could begin to write the process, mm -hmm. uh, write, write the, the uh, the culture. Well, I'm actually very much in support of the closure of Attica at the level of a doable piece of symbolism. The question here is not, well, what about all the other evil prisons? That, that can't be addressed directly. But Attica symbolizes something for New York State residents. I remember exactly where I was. I was only 20 years old, but I know right where I was when I first learned about the rebellion. It so riveted me, and that's probably true for everybody who was living, well, a large part of the people who were living in New York State or, and, and other parts of, of the country. My point is that a closure as a movement it, it might, it would take a long time, but it would symbolize a, a shifting of that movable middle. I'm frankly only interested in the movable middle. I don't really love spending all my time talking to the left because, you know, the left can wail in certain ways that are satisfying to them or to us to listen to, but it doesn't change much. I'm really interested in people who are able to come to a new thought. And so the symbol of the closure of that 
weird Gothic structure. I'm just talking about what it looks like if you see a photo of it. Um, and the knowledge that it has this long history now come to 43 years since the rebellion could be an element for this state and for others that watch. It's just, it's a partial answer to the question of where does the shift take place, which is how I'm listening to your question, Bill. Okay, Assemblyman, what would be on your short list of things that, that might be doable, that you could, where you could begin to turn the tide a little? Well, uh, I have a lot of bills, I have <laughs> a lot of bills, and uh, some of them could be very helpful. Um, you know, one of the problems, I was on a panel at John Jay a couple weeks ago, I lose track of where I've been lately, but it was recently, <laughs> And you know, one of the problems in the mass incarceration model is um, the way our criminal laws are written. The way our criminal laws are written with acting in concert. You know, somebody who could be you know, in Queens at this moment and there's a, a robbery or a murder that takes place in Brooklyn and they could be found guilty of that murder. And so what you end up having is a system of culpability that goes beyond what people's individual conduct is, specifically also uh, as it relates to the definition of violence. So if you become a violent felon in our system, that has a whole bunch of attachments to what you're able to do, where they send you, what programs you can go to, all because something's been defined as violent even if your individual conduct was not violent at all. Um, parole. Uh, I have a bill in that would eliminate the ability of the parole board to use the, what's their term, would deprecate the seriousness of the offense, which essentially allows the parole board to resentence people. So someone gets a 12 to life, and every two years they go before a parole board and say, no, if we let you out, this would deprecate the seriousness of the offense. So hmm. um, you get rid of that. Does that mean that they're going to automatically start releasing more people? No, but they're going to have to come up with a better justification than just throwing a phrase that's currently mm. in the law. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other thing I would say is that um, because of the Rockefeller drug reforms, thank you Jeff Aubrey, we have far fewer people who are in prison for drug-related offenses. And what you have primarily are people who have committed more serious violent offenses. And a huge population of the inmates are mentally ill. And what our prisons have become are what the mental institutions were when I was a child. And we don't address that correctly. Now, we passed a bill a couple of years ago that was signed into law that prohibits docs from putting seriously mentally ill people into solitary. Well, guess what? I was there two days ago. They're not following that rule. Okay, they're not following that rule because they simply recategorize whether or not someone is seriously mentally ill or not. Um, when I was a public defender in Brooklyn from 87 to 95, I tried a lot of rape cases, and here's a shock. Every single rape defendant I had was mentally ill. Every single one, okay? So in the end, you can't take someone who was diagnosed on the street as manic depressive or schizophrenic, put him in a prison and say, oh, he's no longer schizophrenic. That just doesn't really work. So um, I think that there are ways to make some changes that would make some of those things better, but they don't address the ultimate problem, which is who goes to jails, and it's black and brown people, and who doesn't go to jails, which is white people, and what happens when we put them in these prisons. Now, I've not yet been, God help me, to upstate or Southport, but we have prisons which are built entirely full of solitary confinement units. So these are people who, don't, like at Attica, if you get sent to one, you could get taken out or down to keep lock. I don't even want to get into that now. But these are places where people spend years and years and years and years. And you know, one of the, my claims to fame is I was the only non-docs person to speak to Willie Boskett for the last 15 years. Wow. Hmm. And you know, he seemed okay. I had a very pleasant conversation with him. He told me that he thought the warden, uh, superintendent was doing a great job and hmm. you know, clearly you know, he was medicated in some way, but he doesn't leave his cell. He's, his, his cell faces a high window so he can see light. Um, his cell has a shower attached to it, next to it, so when he gets his three showers a week, they open this door electronically. He can go in and take a shower and then it closes electronically behind him. And he chooses not to see anyone or go out of his cell. And I don't, for the life of me, don't understand how that's constitutional, but 
I leave that to great minds that are not mine to deal with that. But in the end, I think there are some mechanisms to, to improve some of the conditions, improve some of the policies, um, but they're uphill battles. We're going to pretty soon need to take some questions from the audience. I thought I'd try one last question on this panel and whoever wants to, to tackle it. We've talked a lot about Attica now. We haven't really talked very much today about Attica then. Hmm. Uh, and in fact, the reality of Attica then is still shrouded to some degree in, in mystery. The grand jury testimony from the investigation into the, into the assault on the prison has never been released. Uh, and according to the latest judicial rulings, probably never will be released. Um, but Attica insinuated itself into the culture, the popular culture, uh, in a way that few other events do. I mean, Charles Mingus and Paul Simon wrote songs about Gil Scott Heron. Uh, it pops up uh, in movies as a kind of slogan in everything from Dog Day Afternoon, most famously, to maybe more obscurely, uh, SpongeBob SquarePants. Um, so it, it, it is an event. It's one of those events that, that is, lives with us. And I'm curious whether you think, beyond Attica itself, it had an influence on how we deal with prisons more broadly. Is it still, does it still in some ways haunt us as we try to make policy about how to deal with mass incarceration? Well, just for the record, I was nine, so I have no <laughs> recollection of it. I do remember Kent State a little bit, but I don't remember when Attica occurred. Um, what I will say to you is that it, it is a word in our societal vocabulary that equates um, to a horrible place. And so I'll be very honest with you, I was afraid when I went to Attica. I was afraid of what I would see. I was afraid of how bad it would be, which is probably part of the reason why I was somewhat relieved that it wasn't as bad as the image in my head. Um, but having been to 20 of them, um, it still remained as the worst place one could go. And, um, and that image- you and mean that part, sort of the prison lore. Yes. And so um, I knew from a variety of people that if they didn't like you, in the dock system, they sent you to Attica. That was your punishment, that you were going to Attica. Um, and so I think that that remains, uh, whether or not that happened because of Paul Simon or Square Bob Punch, whatever the guy's called, whatever that is, <laughs> I don't know. But I do think that it remains the pinnacle of what, what, what prisons should not be. I, I guess if... if, if one thing that strikes me about, I spend a lot of time on the road going between Buffalo and, 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 and the village of Attica. And, you know, there, <laughs> I, and, and when I get to the, the front gate, you know, what's fascinating is to see people who are turned back for mm -hmm. attire violations, right? 70 year old women who are told, no, that won't do. Right, who are very, you know, so there's a Dollar Tree down the, I mean, there's a, the Dollar General down the road that's made a business of, you know, giving people so sweats and skirt. exactly, exactly. Um, there's a speed trap right along Exchange Street, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, and they make money off of people. I mean, this, so in the village of Attica is part of Attica. And you know, every time, every around this time of year, right, the anniversary of the uprising, uh, Attica residents in the village of Attica are interviewed. Many of them still believe that hostages were castrated by uh, prisoners. I mean, that was you know, you know, absolutely contrary to, all contrary, the it, contrary to everything, right? Yeah. But um, that I think part of it is you know that the, one of the reasons why. Uh, Attica, the, the officers at Attica continue to have this notion of, you know, them, you know, it's uh, the zero-sum game, is, you know, you have, you have families, cousins, as Jack was alluding to before, family networks who come in and out off shift all the time dealing with, with prisoners, and, oh, yeah, my, my, my cousin told me you did this, so, you know, let me jack you up, you know, this, you can't get away with that. I mean, there's, there's a way in which uh, the, the mentality of Attica, that's a guard-run prison, is about local people not losing face. 
because if it happens again, it won't be, you know, a, a mistake of, of, of chance, right? It will be, you know, you, you know, folks from rural white New York are, are incompetent. And, and I see that in the attitudes of, of officers as they come in, just that notion that, 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 you know, us versus them. So on a micro level, one thing, you know, I, I believe in leadership from the middle and, and allowing people like, uh, like the superintendents and, the, um, and the, the deps to have more ability to kind of, uh, make local rules, change things on an institutional level. It makes a world of difference for people who walk in and out the facility. Does it change the bigger problem? No, right? But it makes it so much more, um, just less traumatic of an experience for people to come in and out, for, for, for volunteers and, and for family members. So leading from the middle, I think, but also always that there's the, the context of Attica. That's always in the background. I'd add a, a thought here. I don't remember the exact number of incarcerated in 1971, but I believe it was well under 400,000. I'm seeing a, pardon me? 12,000. No, no, the whole nation. Whole nation in, yes. I believe that the number was in the 300,000 area in 1971 for the whole nation. And most of you probably know that the number is close to, it's over 2 million and close to two and a half at various times over the last four or five years. The point being, whatever else Attica was, it was the beginning of a terrible, terrible storm that is not over with. And so it, it is not the high point of something uh, in terms of the resistance. And it's so clear, even from this clip that we watched, that the, the American mind, if you will, the fear of that, that body politic of the black man was in, in uniform. I mean, the, the, the people do in fact express themselves politically and through the force the powers of force that they have both in their police, their corrections officers, and in our military. So it really is a reflection of the terror of racism. That's, that's not a new idea. But the fact that it has grown so steeply each decade uh, since. I once wrote a note, wrote an article uh, but I can't, I haven't studied it, I'm not, a, I'm not that kind of a scientist. Observing that the steepest rise in incarceration took place after the fall of the Soviet Union. And just raising a question, since Americans are so deeply in need of something to hate, did it create a problem not to have the Soviet Union as the thing to hate anymore? And was it easier then for the Southern strategy, Reagan and Lee Atwater and everybody else uh, helping George Sr., was it easier to turn the energies, the negative energies washing up from as long ago as 1971 into uh, a further intensification of incarceration, which from 1991 up through the early days of the first decade of this uh, millennium became uh, just appalling how much incarceration we engaged in. Those are some thoughts about how we're connected to 1971. I don't know why I suddenly feel obliged to stick up for Ronald Reagan, but the, the most dramatic increase in incarceration was under Bill Clinton. 1990s, definitely, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Uh, what's it, Sophia Lee? There she is. Handing it back to the maestro. Okay, we're gonna have the rest of our panelists come up so that we can do our Q&A. Please um, join me in thanking this panel. <laughs> and while our other panelists are joining us, I wanna give you something to think about. We have a human right to freedom and liberty. 
And the state has, through law, the ability to take away your freedom and send you to prison as punishment. I repeat, send you to prison as punishment, not for punishment. And the type of treatment that people have been subjected to that you've been listening to this afternoon makes it clear that what is happening to people once they have been, had their liberty taken away as punishment is that they are repeatedly subjected to additional punishment in the form of violence and abuse. That is not the law. And that is why we're here today, and that's why the Correctional Association is putting on this forum, and we're calling on all of you to join us. And I also want to make it clear, and I'm sure our panelists will, that we're just starting with Attica. We know Clinton's a problem. We know Green is a problem. We know there's many other facilities that are a problem. But Attica is symbolic, as some of the panelists noted. And so we have to start someplace. And everybody in the country remembers the word Attica. So, don't think that we have forgotten those other places. We've called on the Department of Corrections to institute a policy of zero tolerance. We can have zero tolerance for children in school, so why don't we have zero tolerance for abuse from guards in the facilities? Okay, uh, someone queued up here. First question, please just state your name, and I'm going to ask and anybody who's seen me moderate Q&A before knows very clearly, I'm looking for questions, not statements. If you want to be a panelist on our next forum, let us know. <laughs> but we're looking for questions. We have our panelists. OK, first question. Hi, my name, my name is Carlos Rodriguez. I'm a former inmate just recently released from Attica. I'd just like to know, um, us as a collective people in society, what can we do to help you guys and help other organizations shut down Attica? Oh, I love that question. We didn't even ask you to ask that question. Okay, I'm sure there's a few people on the panel who will answer that. Okay. People in government actually read your letters. It's going to come as a shock to you, okay? Every week I know exactly how many letters I got and what the subjects are, okay? Partly, the, re the perception is among elected leaders that your concerns don't matter or this subject doesn't matter because you don't communicate that. If every single state senator and every single state assembly member were to receive in the next month 10 letters on this subject, it would get noticed. No one seems to believe me when I say that, but it is true. And, it's, and from the perspective of internally, my ability to effectuate positive change would be greatly helped if the people who I'm trying to convince heard from their constituency that they care about this too. That's the simple and easiest thing to do from this meeting for us. Uh, we at the Correctional Association also have a few other ideas, additional ones, which I would strongly endorse that activism. We're actually going to have a meeting on October 9th at 6 p.m. at the Correctional Association in which we are going to organize people to make a concerted effort to change Attica. This is not the end, but rather just the beginning. We also have several proposals about how they could reduce violence. The one thing that hasn't been said today is there are other models, even in New York. There's a facility called Eastern Correctional Facility, which is a maximum security facility. It has some recent problems, but in the past it had greater uh, participation. There's a fundamental issue. Do you treat people inside as human beings and communicate with them? or do you suppress and use violence? There are alternatives. Okay. I'd want to add just one yes. thing. Hitchhiking off Nick Kristoff's discovery, if you will, that so many white people wrote him and said, no, no, we're not the problem, they are. If you're white, hang on to the commitment to bring other white people into the circle of awareness that racism is the driving evil in America. Do it. Um, just to add on, the communities that are mostly affected by mass incarceration are not really informed or organized. 
And when the community become more informed, they become empowered. And they can get the letters to O'Donnell and to other legislators. And as he said, once we hold our legislators responsible by being informed, then change and power comes into play. We don't empower ourselves. We just have this discussion here and we leave it here. So when we go back to the community, start organizing the people in the community and inform them of what's going on and how they can get involved. I just want to add one thing to that. It's no small notion that the Correctional Association is 170 years old. So we have a little bit of, um, what did you say? Uh, stick to itiveness, you might say. So I would urge you, join with us because we're committed to making this change. And the more people that help us do it, the shorter the journey will be to claim victory. I'm going to call, I'm sure there's somebody on my right who has a question. I want to thank you very much for doing this. Um, my question is, in, as far as the incarceration being penalization, I've learned recently that the correctional officers have strong unions. And I was wondering what's in place as far as having a disciplinary um, measure for the correctional officers and attacking the unions in which um, they're working for. Uh, why not go after the, the higher ups of the unions and put disciplinary or complaints in, in, in enforcing that? Is there something going to be done in that regard? Anybody on the panel want to? Well, um, uh Positive Let's answer? just say that I'm not really popular with the, the Corrections Officers Union, okay? Um, and they sometimes accompany me on tours that I've taken. Uh, but like I said earlier, I meet with the inmate leadership team privately, so there's no one from Corrections and no one from my scope are present. Um, recently, I believe the new, newly elected president ran on the platform, it's us versus them, and was elected to be the head of the Corrections Officers Union. So um, the political problem is not for me, obviously, um, I represent uh, Upper West Side of Manhattan. I don't think I have any nice SCOBA members in my district. If I do, I've not heard from them. Um, but I have colleagues who have three or 4,000 people who are in their districts who are nice SCOBA members. And when I went to Clinton uh, and we heard exactly how and where the inmates were being beaten, my Republican colleague who was there believed the inmates too. So um, what I, the best way to answer that is you would have to get somebody either internally or somebody who has a much better relationship with them than I do to lead that fight because they um, perceive me as the enemy. I'd like to say a brief thing on this. Violence happens inside a prison because there is no accountability. And there's no accountability because there are no mechanisms in which the incarcerated population are believed and are powerful. So that the disciplinary system is that 96% of everybody who's charged with a disciplinary violation are found guilty. There's no system that could be that, that accurate. Similarly, the disciplinary system against staff is just the opposite reverse. You never see officers disciplined. It is so rare that it makes the news in those towns where there are hundreds and thousands of these incidents, there's almost no discipline of officers. And so we have a series of proposals that's gonna come out in our, in our report soon that will deal with this, but it's a very difficult one because it's all biased. Essentially, they don't believe the incarcerated population, and then their staff is have not held accountable first at the facility level, and if on the rare occasions when it gets beyond that, there's an administrative hearing, and most of the people are, are, are then found not guilty in that level. So if you don't have accountability, you're never going to have uh, this curtailed. There are things that can be done to try to improve that that system is fundamentally flawed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We got one here. And I just want to add one thing. So we can put this in perspective, back in about De December, I think it was 2012, some guards from Attica, four of them were indicted because of the brutal beating that they had visited upon a man named George Wallace. This was um, history making in New York State before guards to be indicted. 
The response from the rest of the guards at Attica was to stage such a serious work slowdown that visits couldn't happen, meals didn't happen, and they persisted in this to show their solidarity with their brothers who had been indicted for this brutal beating that they had visited upon this man. So when you, we think about and talk about the fact that the guards run the prison, this is the, what we're up against. So when you talk about are we going to take on Nyskova, it is more than a notion. So you can have the most, the but most well-meaning superintendent. He's still up against his, his staff, which are guards, and he has very little control over weeding out the bad apples, as was shown to us in that And if I may 12. add to that, when I was there on Thursday, um, and the NYSCOBA representative was in the room, I said, why don't you take your bad apples and move them around, move them out of C block, you know, whatever else it was, and he, the, the superintendent said very clearly, I'm not permitted to do that. The, the, the contract requires me to let them bid on their shifts. And so I turned to the nice Goba guy, I said, well, I guess it's your fault then, right? So in the end, th that is part of the problem um, from a larger perspective, but I was told that those indicted officers are going to trial, I think, in November. Is that right? That's the last that I heard. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yes. So, you know, I know we're almost out of time. So what I'd like to do, Keep, well, the, the lady in charge says keep going, we shall. We are, here. we are here. Okay, then I will not do what I was getting ready to do and I'll take the next question from my left. Let me just say something. I want, just wanna say something really important. We're talking about organizing. Uh, the CA is now, we have a group uh, that's called the Advisory Council for the Prison Visiting Project. And that group is composed of people who are formerly incarcerated the family members of those who were formerly incarcerated, and hopefully as more and more people uh, realize how they're also impacted uh, will uh, come into the fold. And this is not about meeting to just talk, it's about meeting so that we can empower from a more grassroots perspective and do the things that can hold uh, part of the expression uh, of Mr. O'Donnell and his colleagues fire to, feet to the fire so that things change, sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Rita Helley Jensen, and I'm editor-in-chief of Women's E-News. And it's very frustrating to read a Nick Kristoff column about this issue that totally excludes women. I, I know that the Correction and Society is expanding its vision, but from my perspective, the role that African-American women play, and Latinas, um, in this drama is profound, and the profound silence from the advocates from Nick Kristoff on down is very disturbing. So therefore, I'm asking maybe Bill Keller to expand the vision, if you think it's, I don't know if it's under the aegis of what you're doing, to include the consequences of massive incarceration onto the black community the women left alone, uh, as well as the rising proportion of women being incarcerated. Thank you. Oh, Nick Kristoff can defend himself. He's pretty good at it. But I, I will say, I, I can't think of any columnist writing today who has been a stauncher advocate of empowering women than Nick Kristoff. So he, he may have failed to touch that base in, in those particular columns, but uh, he's written columns and books, in fact, co-written with his wife, uh, ar arguing that the world would be a much better place if women had a larger share of power. Um, since you We're asked working about, on that. Uh, since you asked about pursuing the subject of criminal justice, I'll take one minute to plug um, the Marshall Project, which is named for Thurgood Marshall. Um, we are launching in October, probably the last half of October, uh, we will have a website, but also partnerships with other media organizations. We did our first with the Washington Post. We have one in the works with the New York Times, and we have a consortium of newspapers, radio stations, broadcasters who want to partner with us to look at not just incarceration, but that will be a large part of it, but law enforcement, the courts, uh, and what we generally perceive as the uh, massive dysfunction of the American criminal justice system. 
And just so that you, I'm, I'm not sure if you are aware that the Correctional Association has three different core projects. One of them is the Women in Prison Project, the, the Prison Visiting Project, and the Juvenile Justice Project. So please see us afterwards so we can get you involved with our Women in Prison Project. We'd love to have you. Okay, I'm sure someone to my right has a question. Hi, my name is Gail George, and the assemblyman said that when he went to Attica, it wasn't as bad as he thought. So my question to him and anyone else on the panel is, do you think the conduct and the culture that's allowed to exist in Attica has a connection to the violence on inmates that's proliferating throughout the other prisons that he mentioned, Great Meadows and the other one? Um, since it was my statement, I guess I have to defend it. Um, you know, partly maybe that was just what the perception is. The first thing I say when I meet the inmate leadership team is, is this place safe? That's my first question at every prison I go to. And at Clinton, they almost laughed at me because they thought it was the most ridiculous thing that I ever heard. Um, they then provided me with specific detail about where they're beaten while they're shackled, uh, where it occurs, I mean, it was such ho harrowing detail that there was no way it could have been made up. Um, at Attica, the, the, they didn't laugh at it. Um, they said that there are safer places to be and less safe places to be, which led to a conversation about C Block um, and led to a conversation about other behaviors um, that are clearly inappropriate, but not at that same level. I, I don't, I had never heard the expression uh, you know, putting legs and feet on someone until I got to green. So um, I think that uh, th that the previous questioner about the power of Nyscoba is true, and there are bad apples, and the bad apples create a rotten barrel. Um, in the end, my perception was, you know, if I had to go to one of them tomorrow, I wouldn't want to go to Attica, but I would certainly go to Attica before I went to Clinton. And... Um, and when I met with the superintendent after that conversation, I said to him, you're gonna to have to do something about this because I can't come here and hear that and not get a response on what you're doing to fix it. So, um, you know, I'm only one guy. I can only go to so many prisons a week and I actually have other things to do, you know, as an assemblyman, but I'm trying the best I can to turn my attention to it to make sure that the people who run it know that somebody's looking. Um, up till now, I've gone to them and they knew I was coming, but as a member of the state legislature, my pass allows me into any state prison or any jail, including Rikers Island, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And sometime soon, I'm gonna start showing up unannounced um, to see. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad that you're happy that I have to drive all over New York State, but uh, uh, to see what I see at that time, and if I just want to segue one second about Rikers, obviously, you know, NYSCOBA has nothing to do with Rikers, and look at the culture at Rikers, right, which is, which is as bad or possibly worse. Um, I'm, tomorrow I'm putting out a press release calling on the governor uh, to appoint a special prosecutor, because after those two guys were, were beaten so horribly that the Bronx DA couldn't figure out that they were, that he should charge someone, says to be no one in that system, you know, is objective enough to look at it. At least the Wyoming County DA was willing to indict someone, right? The idea that it's happening right here in our backyard um, is problematic. So I think that we have to all collectively, you know, do what we can. And in this job, I get to show up. So that's what I'm trying to do. I think it's important from the CA standpoint that we say we have pushed uh, about Attica today because it is that symbolism, but we in no sense are suggesting that that's the only difficult place. Clinton is very bad, we would agree. We have written an 80-page report about it. Um, Green is a horrible place. We're about to issue a report about that. Great Meadow has a terrible history and continues to be problematic. There are other places that are very bad. That does not mean that you don't take action against one of the places that is a symbol of that violence. Um, we do have suggestions about mechanisms that could improve things, but we need to take action October 9th, please. Um, 
Sometimes when officials come into facilities, you know, um, and they're known to come ahead of time, what usually happens at the facility level, the superintendent, deputy security, and the staff, they prepare the facility for his arrival. So, you know, you're going to get the halls clean. You're going to have the guards that have more madness on at that particular time that's well-spoken. And a lot of times you're going to meet maybe with a selective group from the um, administrative level. Not all the time. And a lot of times at the facility level, many of the men are really afraid to speak out because of retaliation. Retaliation is real. You know, they don't want to be going to the box or they don't want to get their cell search or they don't want to get beat up. But to Mr. Donald's credit, he's going to go in, as he said, unannounced. And this is when you get to see actually how the facility is run. See, when you go in unannounced, they can't prepare for you. And you'll get to see actually what goes on under the watch of whoever was on at that particular time. So I, you know, I applaud you for doing that. Because not too many people do that. We always go in, even PVP, we have to coordinate our visits ahead of time. And they know when we come. And a lot of times they prepare for us. And a lot of times when we went to Green, I believe the youth there didn't want to speak to us. They were so afraid because that's a medium facility and they're about to go home. So they said, now we don't want to talk to you. Get away from me. You see how frightened people can get because their life and their freedom is on the line. So it's a little different at times. We've had grown men when in the midst of an interview with us break down crying because they want to be honest and tell us not only the brutality that they have personally experienced, but what they have witnessed happen to other people, but they are so afraid of the retaliation, personal beatings or getting another ticket such that they now can't go home and they may be um, close to being released from prison. One of the phenomena that we see frequently is some of the most horrific beatings are visited upon people who are very close to being released because the guards know that they don't dare say anything for fear that their release date will be compromised. So there's a, there's a lot of problems in the system, which is why we need all of you to join us. I think we can take two more questions. Is that good? Okay, to my left and then to my right. And you know what I'm going to ask? I'll ask for both questioners to pose your question before we have the um, panel respond, so that should help us to stay closer to our time target. Okay, uh, my name is Carl Dix. I want to start by noting where I was when Attica happened. I was in the Leavenworth Military Penitentiary in the hole where I had been placed for refusing to go to Vietnam and because they thought I was trying to organize the prison. But I remember exactly what happened. And the people in Attica standing up and asserting their humanity is what put me on the path that led me to become a revolutionary today. I want to pose a question about a strategic approach to stopping mass incarceration. This strategic approach comes off of a month of resistance to mass incarceration that Cornell West and myself called a month of varied forms of resistance, sermons in religious institutions, cultural programs, programs on college campuses, coordinated nationwide demonstrations through which tens of thousands of people will act in a variety of ways to stop mass incarceration, to put a big stop sign up on these horrors, and through that reach to millions more, impact and move them, some of the middle that our Reverend Phelps talked about. And I would, I root some of this in what Brother Muhammad was talking about, about the relationship between incarceration, the murder of Eric Garner, Ferguson, and that people have to stop closing their eyes and stand up and do something about it. I'd like the panelists to respond to that strategic approach. Thank you. Okay, and we have a question to my right. Hi, I'm Randolph Scott McLaughlin II, and my You're back. How are you doing? <laughs> nice to see you again, too. Okay. Um, I am from the, uh, the counseling psychology kind of uh, standpoint. So uh, in, in, in this field that I'm part of, we don't really focus on the effects of incarceration on the families, much like one of the other questions was posed to the community of how does the 
impact of incarceration on the women and the children left behind impact them. Um, so my question to the panel is, given this kind of dehumanization of the inmates and the, uh, the fact that the guards really run the prison and can make visitations happen or not happen, um, what do you see as potentially being a way to involve the family members who are on the outside, who could support their, uh, their loved one who's in prison, uh, given the system that they're involved in? And how may the existence of a family member in the prison help humanize the prisoner to the guards that are dehumanizing them? Okay, thank you for those two questions. Panelists? Oh, with family members. Um, in order for someone to come home and they have a family, that means they have a foundation. Uh, it's, it's very important to have family ties while you're away. I know it's hard to travel to go see a loved one, but writing a letter, um, accepting a phone call, these little things keep what you would call ties. And many family members have a hardship because although they're doing time in a way that those who've done time won't understand, nevertheless, they're suffering. And there's, there's, no, there's, there's no therapy, there's no community group they can rely on. And even at the church level, when they have the prison ministries, many family members are scared to acknowledge that they have a loved one that's incarcerated. I know that in my community, you know, I've, I've gone to churches and asked, how many family members here have a loved one that's on parole, probation, or incarcerated? And you see them slowly raise their hand because it's a big hidden secret. And once the secret out, now we can deal. And I deal with them and I explain to them the most important thing from you that your loved one need is just you being there, being present. You know, the package, that's all good. But that letter, knowing that you can receive a letter from your loved one or to hear them on the phone, it means so much. It's invaluable. And we must understand that that's what makes us human, our interaction with other human beings. Once that's taken away, you know, I tell you, you become an introvert, you become, you become a beast. You know, you become that which they're trying to make you. So, you know, let's, let's, I never forget about families because my sister told me many years ago, she said, your absence is a big void in our home. Your voice is not heard. Your presence is missed. And we don't know how to function without you. And it hurt me. It hurt me deeply. I just want to um, say, I, you know, I, with respect to families, right, writing letters, uh, phone calls, um, staying in touch with family are everyday acts of resistance as well, right? And they support the women and children uh, who uh, have to cope with the absence of you in the home. And, and it, it, the situation for, for women is even worse in many ways, although the focus is on Attica, so I'll talk more about men. I just want to mention uh, the FRP program. Uh, the Family Reunion Program allows for 72 hours of visitation. It, there are trailers on, it's in all maximum security facilities and some mediums. I know there's uh, uh, trailers at Albion now. Um, but that's an excellent way for families to come. I mean, it, it involves basically living at the prison, right? So um, that has, I mean, every family has to weigh how much that's going to affect them and whether that's appropriate for them. Um, but it is a way uh, to visit with your loved ones, um, and, and we, aunts, uncles, you know, every, without uh, that kind of visiting room tension that you sometimes feel. If you're lucky feel. enough to live in New York, I think there are only three right. states that still have those programs. Um, and if I could just add, um, I get about 100 letters a week, um, and lately a lot of them are about the family reunion program and the fact that uh, who's ever responsible for approving them in Albany, the central office, has become very reluctant to approve them and actually sort of make up reasons to say no. So that is something I'm turning my focus to uh, when I get back uh, to work because um, this is new. But it's a very good program, it's a very effective program, um, and it allows people to feel human in a dehumanizing environment. Yeah, just 
stay at home really, really briefly, there's three ways that a person can sustain a long-term incarceration. Um, the person needs to have religion, a God in their lives, a relationship with God. Um, the person needs to have education, and obviously the person needs to have family support. The family support doesn't necessarily have to come from his biological family. It can be his extended family. But that family needs to encourage him to take advantage of what opportunities there are in the, in the prison. He needs, they need to encourage the individual to take advantage of the GED program. There's a high illiteracy rate in New York State prisons we don't, that we don't talk about. But there are too many individuals there who cannot read or write. And that needs to change. Yes, sir. I just didn't, I didn't want to ignore the other question, but very quickly, and this is call to action. And I think there are many different ways. Um, as if you looked at this audience, I was very pleased to see it when we were at our maximum. There were a lot of young people here. Mm -hmm. I believe that uh, reaching out to the campuses, I know Five is out there who has done a lot of work trying to reach out to the campuses. Um, they do relate, I think, to this notion because it seems so insane that you're taking so many people out of community and locking them up for so long. And so I am, I've been doing this work for 33 years. I am actually more optimistic now that we can have change. I've seen work on solitary confinement that never existed where people are fighting it. And I believe we can reach out to other communities because what we're doing is wrong and it has to change. Well, on that note, we're going to wrap it up. I think Elizabeth is going to phase us out. Come on and phase us out, Elizabeth. Let's have a, a wonderful round of applause for Sophia Liger. Thank you. Uh, there were three things that I just wanted to uh, sort of highlight and underline um, as I was listening to, to this panel. Uh, one is a, the large problem that we face in this country of unconscious racism. Uh, as raised, and, and it really folds into not only having a prison system that needs to be fixed, but indeed we have an entire country that needs to be fixed. I think that the prison system is a symptom of what is going on in this country, and one of the reasons that I put up the uh, New York Times pieces that I did in the beginning is because I think it identifies that not only are people of color um, um, under, um, <laughs> under siege, but in many ways, in too many ways, I think we all are. Um, secondly, uh, I wanted to point out um, that Ronald Reagan probably doesn't need defending. <laughs> and um, I'm sorry you felt the need to defend him. <laughs> And uh, that if Ron, it, during, it was during the 80s under Ronald Reagan that the entire infrastructure was put in place, which has created, in fact, the mass incarceration opportunities and possibilities that we have. The fact that it happened in the 90s under Bill Clinton is unfortunate, and the fact that it's continuing under Barack Obama is even more unfortunate. So I just wanted to uh, point that out. I want to say that tomorrow, Sophia Elijah will be here hosting you, and again next Saturday. And I thank you all for coming, and I thank our panelists very much for all the work you do. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.